Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everybody. I'm Stevie. I'm an alcoholic. I'm an addict. And I, too, am nervous. I've been sober today by the grace of God, and that's the only way I know of. Um, Everything I've done got me here. I know that um, a lot of a lot of what got me here was also the grace of God, because I couldn't have uh, couldn't have needed the questions or had the questions. I don't think that uh, that I try to find out the answers to these days without the grace of God. I started off my drinking and using career, oh, I guess early 60s, when I was somewhere around uh, seven or eight years old. I grew up in an alcoholic family. My father was an alcoholic, and... Even though I saw the problems that alcohol caused in our family, I still found it attractive for some reason. I don't know what that was. I thought I was missing something. I was always a kid who was afraid I was going to miss something. Somewhere along the line, I started trying to uh, find out why. My father would go back and and continue to drink, even though every time he did, I saw what happened, which was big fights, you know, violence. Um, And we were always real scared of him. But he continued to do it anyway, and I never never did understand what that was until one day, a few years later, I realized that I wasn't doing anything any differently other than making a little bit more money and add a few drugs to it, you know. Um... I guess about seven or eight years old, I started stealing drinks. Either, uh, well, my parents used to have these, these 42 parties, and quite a few people would come over, and they'd be, uh, having their Tom Collins or whatever, you know, and when somebody wasn't looking, I'd take one of the drinks and run in the kitchen, you know, and make them a new one, and, uh, <laughs> refresh their drink, you know. It's just that I would refresh my memory about what it tasted like a lot of the time. I never really, I never really thought that it tasted very good or anything. And then, one, then one day I tried to, I tried to uh, make myself a drink out of my dad's bourbon. It was in the freezer. It didn't taste very good either. I guess it was the wrong brand or something. But somewhere along the line, I started finding that attractive somehow. About the same time, I went to a ear, nose, and throat doctor who, it was general practice with him. When you, when you went in for him to take a look up your nose, he would squirt you full of what I later found out was a strong solution of liquid cocaine. And I never really knew why my face was numb when I left there <laughs> and why I felt a little different. But I later on found out that I didn't know how to breathe without the stuff. So. Because it was in a nose spray he gave me. The first bottle said use, you know, once every 24 hours. The second bottle said use two or three sprays every 12 hours. And the next one said use as needed. (laughs) And I did. (laughs) But I guess as I was going into junior high was when I started, when I really started trying to drink. We'd moved to Graham, Texas, and I really didn't want to go at all. Um, I'd, I'd gotten in the first band that I really wanted to be in and was excited about it. And we had to move, and I had to give up everything, you know, including my way. We got to Graham, and uh, 
my parents had told me we were going to be there for about six weeks. And that was about six weeks into the six months that we stayed there. While I was going to school there, actually the first day I went to school there in Graham, Texas, just to show you what kind of, how much I liked it. I got kicked out of school three times the first day. <laughs> and uh, I didn't even do anything. You know, I just went to school and they didn't like how my belt was, uh, they didn't like how my hair was cut twice. You know. And uh, I real quick found this guy that sold, he sold Alka-Seltzer bottles full of, full of sour mash. And uh, continue to find him every day, you know. Even though I, did, I didn't like how it tasted or anything, it just kind of helped me smooth along, you know. Because there wasn't anything that I really wanted there. I'd get beat up all the time. And, and there wasn't anybody to play any music with. Well, we stayed there for about six months, and finally I just told my parents that I wasn't going back to school anymore. And so that ended up being about the same time we moved back to Dallas. And back to Dallas for me was, I didn't realize what I was doing at the time, but really all I, all I really was doing here at the time was, uh, well, I was trying to play music and everything, but, but the main thing I was doing was hanging out with the kids down the street. And uh, what they did all the time was, see how they could get high this way or that way, you know. And I thought that well, all I was doing was just trying to be in with the people, you know, with these kids. What I was really doing was learning how to get high and stay high all the time and run away from what was going on, which was, uh, I guess what was going on really was that, uh, you know, people grow up and they learn things about living life and, uh, and grow. I didn't, uh, I never, that never dawned on me. I just, thought you just kind of went from day to day and you got older and then things happened and you graduate and or quit school or whatever. At any rate, I learned, uh, I just learned how to bag glue and how to, how to figure out this pill was this kind and this was that kind and if you hit real hard on this joint you might get a buzz. Usually I was scared to though at the time. thing was is that was the only thing I knew how to do. The only thing I knew how to do was just try to try to get by every day. I wasn't really learning anything about living life. There was really no information at home because I, I couldn't, it was pretty violent in my house. I couldn't go and, and ask my dad about things. Um, <laughs> I couldn't go ask my dad about about school or about girls or about anything because it was uh it was pretty much you're supposed to know that stuff on your own <laughs> or just leave me alone. Is that your stuff? Get it out of the room, you know. So I uh, I just continued to try to find out things from the kids down the street, and that wasn't the way to really go. I didn't know that. What I did keep learning though was about was about bands and what not to blame not to blame my drinking or anything on bands, but I sure learned a lot about it there because <laughs> that was and still is unfortunately a lot of in a lot of places that's where a lot of the myth about it's real neat to get high or real cool to get high that's where I learned a lot of it because a lot of the people I really looked up to really knew how to drink and really knew how to get high and uh Along with every time I would get in a better band, it seemed like there were better drugs. <laughs> and uh better brand of a uh, gin or whatever, you know. And I always thought I had to keep up. I just thought I had to keep up. Why that was, I don't know. I would see... uh I would see someone who I really cared about and know that they, this, this is a pattern that's gone on most of my life and I still don't understand why it's attractive to me or has been. I would see someone who I really cared and loved, you know, cared for and loved and that they couldn't, 
do anything unless they were shooting something. And I would see that it would be literally killing them, and that would be a good reason for me to try it. I don't know. I don't understand that. That's what. That's a pattern that I developed. I saw it with my father. I saw it with very close friends, and I've seen it with people who are no longer alive, you know. I'm glad to say that I'm not doing that anymore. Because there was a stage in my life where I got to uh, experiment. Not like I thought experimenting was in the first place, but what happens to you if you do this much, you know? There was a time in my life when... Uh, a normal day would be to pull out whatever I could get my hands on and do it all at once. It wasn't do it till it was gone, it was do it all right then. And it would be enough to kill somebody. But for some reason, that was what I did. And I would sit there and go, well, this is what happens, and, and stay alive somehow. And I got it in my head that that was a I don't know, somewhere along the line, I got this verse, or it's not even a verse, it's just something in the Bible where uh, in the last days people will be trying to kill themselves and can't. And that's what I thought I was doing, I think. For some reason, I thought I couldn't die. I guess that's that Superman deal that we get. Through the years, all this progressed, and I just got to where um, everything I was doing was on a road to killing me. The only thing that I was doing that wasn't destructive was trying to play music. But that was really quickly everything else. I still cared about someday finding something that meant something to me inside and with another person or with other people. I still cared about growing somehow. But bit by bit, all of that was going somewhere in the past where uh, I couldn't reach it anymore. It was like, a, it was like a, something that I couldn't reach anymore, something that I just could dream about. And the things that I was doing every day was more like a trudge just to keep keep going because I didn't know how to stop anything I was doing or the predicaments I was in. Then one day about close to three and a half years ago, I started realizing that I could not live on the way I was going, but I could not stop either. I didn't know how to stop, and I knew that I couldn't keep going. That was a real strange place to be for me, because I literally could not imagine the next day without a big bag of dope and several bottles of, of whiskey. I thought that, uh, literally what I thought was that I would go on doing that until I died, and then it would be a lot better because I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. And in my mind, that seemed like a real good solution because I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore, but the people that I was mad at would. Yeah. I don't know why that seemed so neat to me. Uh, I don't know why I was that mad at people, you know? I guess I was probably mad at myself. That's really what it was. Because to be honest, at the time, I thought those people were really uh, trying to get revenge on me or whatever, and that's why they did the things that they were doing. And really the truth of the matter was that I was just trying to get revenge on people that I couldn't understand, you know.
But instead of instead of doing it till I died, what happened was uh, I collapsed, and just gave up. It was it was funny because I saw it coming for a while, and the reason that I wouldn't let go and give up that fight in the first place was because of what other people would think. You know what they would think. Not that uh. They would find out that I was getting loaded, or not that they would find out how bad off I'd, I'd gotten, but w that they would think that I was weak because I gave up. And uh, it took a lot to find out that that was the stronger thing to do, was to say, I can't do this anymore. You know, I have to live instead of die. So I woke up, I say I woke up, I got up and went to a friend of mine's hotel room and uh, sat there shaking and said, you know, this is what's going on. And uh, they called me an ambulance. And we were in Germany at the time. We went to went to this hospital and uh, somehow, somehow I got the nerve to get out of that hospital r real quick because... Uh, I thought it was kind of strange. They kept asking me questions and then ignored me when I answered them. You know, and uh, then, it, then it dawned on me that they were speaking German. <laughs> and, <laughs> no wonder they weren't listening. You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did get out of there and went to a. It was a couple of days later, but I ended up going to a hospital. They're going to see a doctor in London, and he he was someone that I'd heard of that I knew that that could do some, that do, could do some good and give me some help. And he put me in a hospital for a few days and and uh, just kind of looked out after me for a little bit while he basically detoxed me. I said basically detox me because the guy didn't have. That that conventional of an idea of, of detox. It was uh, if I needed, if I really needed a drink, I could have one. If I really thought I really needed a drink, he thought I should have one within about a five day period, because he, the way he looked at it and the way he told me was, if you've been drinking for 25 years, you're not going to stop in a minute, you know. Instead of giving me uh, being a barbital or whatever it is they usually give you, he gave me. Said, he just said you can go have a drink if you really need one over the next five days, and in fact he gave me he gave me a drink on my birthday, which I was in the hospital. A little bitty cup of champagne. What really happened after that was I got out of the hospital and we flew back to the states to go to treatment, and I tried to get drunk on the plane. It didn't work. It didn't work. And what I'd done was I went, this was pretty funny to me, I went to my mother. She'd come over to see me in the hospital. I called her up and said, I called her and my girlfriend and said, look, I'm in the hospital. This is what's going on. They both were there the next day. And I'm real grateful for that. It means a lot to me. They, uh, we were on our way back over to the States. And I was sitting there next to my mother. And I didn't have any money, so I borrowed $20 to go buy some cigarettes on the plane. And uh, she knew there was no machine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I went and tried to find out how many Crown Royals I could get, you know. And uh, there's never enough. I, I learned that a long time ago. There's never enough dope and there's never enough to drink. There's either too much or not enough. You know, there's never just enough. But I, uh, I went and tried anyway, and went back and I felt, I don't know, I felt guilty already. I'm real good at the guilt, you know. I went straight back to the seat, sat down next to her, you know. And looked, this is not what I did, you know. And she went, I kind of knew that, you know. And uh, anyway, we went back. We got, we got, we landed, and and uh, I went to a hotel room, stayed there until the next day, went into treatment. 
I didn't expect to find out in treatment that that was one of the coolest places I'd ever been. That's what I found out, you know. It wasn't uh, what I thought it was going to be at all. I went through the regular stuff, you know, what if they find out I'm a hero, and who's they, and, you know. <laughs> and and I don't want to be here and all, you know, all that stuff. But once I, once I got, once I started paying attention to what was going on in treatment, to the recovery, it's been something that I really wanted ever since. Not always been real good at sticking to a good, strong program, but at least I know that when I'm able to find those steps in my life that it works. And it's really the only thing that does. Because anything else I'm doing is just trying to fix something else up to look the way I want it to look or to be the way I want it to be. Instead of working my way into living life. But what I found in treatment was the same thing that I find in a meeting when I'm in the right place, in my heart at a meeting, and that's a bunch of people trying to help each other live life and grow in it. That's always been something that I've wanted to know about, and it's always been something that I've wanted to do. It's not always been something that I've done. Sometimes I don't even know what grow means. But it's something that uh, I find every once in, once in a while I find growth. And then I feel like me. If that's not where I'm at, then I feel like a shell with a bunch of static going on. That's really the way I feel. I don't know. In the, in the program... They have found the only real lasting happiness that I've ever had. And it lasts whether I can really reach it or not. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but I know that it's there even though I can't always feel it. Because I know it's not out of, it's not out of something that I've made or bought or conned somebody out of. It's something that's bound to be real. And I see it, I see it when I see it, other people come out of a real hard place to be into a more comfortable place with themselves. I know that must be growth. It's not just a new pair of boots or something. You know? I don't know, the hardest things that I've learned so far, I guess, are probably letting go of my own way, getting my own way, other people acting the way that I think they should act, or looking the way that I think they should look. I'm not out of that yet. It's just, that's my way, you know. My way is not the right way necessarily at all. And it's hard to admit that. It's hard to admit that I don't know it all. That's what I used to think. I used to think that if it wasn't done my way, that it was completely wrong and it couldn't be anything close to right because you just didn't know. I know it's kind of it's sometimes I find out that it's it's real comfortable not knowing everything, you know, not knowing anything. In fact, it's funny I'm real uncomfortable saying that right now. That's the truth. I don't know. I just know that it, when I come to meetings, when I take the time to pray and to listen, 
and to take a look at myself. And try to change that I grow. And when I try to offer that to someone else, I feel better. And that I don't have any need to drink or to take any drugs. And if that's what this program does, if that's all it does, then it's helped me a whole lot. Because that's all I used to know, is drinking and using drugs. It's really all I knew. Because I didn't know how I felt. I still don't always know how I feel. A lot of times I uh, still find myself confused about what I think and what I feel. I don't know the difference very often. And that's a scary place to be a lot of times. But slowly, day by day, that's working out. It's working out for the better. It's been uh, about three and a half years, I guess, close to three and a half years, since I've had to drink. And it struck me, it struck me New Year's Eve that to go and do what I had to do New Year's Eve was uh, a lot different this year that I've noticed it being in the past. You know. In the a couple of years ago it was like this. Last year it was kind of a daze. I was sick, but it was kind of a daze. This year I was actually happy to be alive. And noticed that I didn't have to be high to be up till five in the morning or whatever it was. You know. And that it, that I could look out and, and realize that I'm starting a new year with with new things to try to do, new things to try to care about. And one of them was me, and one of them was y'all, and what, what I do with my life, the commitments, you know. Commitments has been another thing that I've never been very good at in my life. Well, I could get caught up in something real good, you know. I could get caught up in the in the mirror combing my hair, you know, or uh, <laughs> whatever. But commitments have not been something that I've been very good at because I was more scared of making commitment than I was following it through. You know? But I realize that I'm still alive now. And that's a that's an amazing thing to me. When I was 17, I thought I wouldn't make it to 21. When I made it to 21, I thought something was, something's up, you know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> you know, when I passed 30, I thought something's wrong. <laughs> I don't know, it's... I'm just glad to be alive today. Glad to be alive today. I don't know. I don't really have a whole lot to say about anything other than knowing that if I let this program and if I let God do what he's going to do in my life through you or through whatever, that it's a whole lot better than I ever could have done it myself before I came to this program. I thank you all for letting me be here with you. Whether I know what to say about it or not, it means a lot to me. And I thank you, okay? Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. 
Thank you very much. 